What if Doma was never turned into a demon? What if Muzan never met him and thus never offered to turn him into a demon? How would that impact the life of Inosuke as well as the entire Demon Slayer story? Well, I spent hours thinking about it and I finally figured out how the story would play out. Let's begin. Ever since his birth, Doma was hailed as a supernatural presence by both his parents and his followers. I mean, they even created the so-called Eternal Paradise, which was a cult dedicated to him. You see, since Doma was born with a pair of polychromatic eyes, the people saw him as a deity and hence treated him as something close to a god. However, Doma was born to be a sociopath who showed or felt no emotions, and he only saw his followers as foolish and pitiful worms begging him for mercy. When Doma was a boy, his mother killed his father after finding out he had been cheating on her before she took her own life. However, Doma remained unfazed by the deaths of his own parents. When he was 20 years old, Doma met Muzan Kibutsuji, who granted him power and turned him into a demon. But at this point, we will assume that this never happens, and hence Muzan never turns Doma into a demon. Because of that, Doma lives the rest of his life as a normal human and plays no role in the normal story that takes place several centuries after his death. Well, all I'm gonna say is thank God Doma was born in the period he did. Otherwise, I do have a small feeling that he would kind of become Inosuke's stepdad otherwise. After all, Doma did have a pretty major crush on Inosuke's mom, Kotoha. But if you ever wondered how the story would play out, hear this. After all, Doma's absence causes major differences in the entire plot of Demon Slayer. But what do we mean by that? Well, hear me out. Around a century before Tanjiro was born, Doma was promoted into the rank of Upper Moon 6 before his later promotion into the Upper Moon 2. One day, when he walked into the streets of Red Light District while he was killing and eating numerous girls, he accidentally encountered Yutaro and his soon-to-die sister, Daki. Doma witnessed Yutaro's spiteful vow to seek vengeance for his dear sister and the mistreatment the siblings suffered. Sensing their despair, Doma offered a chance to him and turned both Yutaro and Daki into demons. But since in our story, Doma died multiple centuries ago, he is not there to turn the siblings into demons. You see, because of that, Daki dies shortly after due to her injuries. Yutaro starts seeking revenge, but even if he manages to kill a few people, he is shortly after put down as well, even if Yutaro was strong. There was only so much he can do against multiple fully grown adults. So not only was Doma's place as Upper Moon 2 empty for taking, so was the position of Upper Moon 6. In this situation, we believe the upper ranks would be as following. Kokushibo remains as the Upper Moon 1. Akaza moves from Upper Moon 3 to Upper Moon 2. Hantengu is now Upper Moon 3. Gyoko, Upper Moon 4. While the new addition to the Upper Moons is Rui, that now has the rank of Upper Moon 5. The Upper Moon 6 position is occupied by Nakime, who becomes an Upper Moon from the start and not later on, like it happened in the original story. Fast forward to a few years before episode 1. Kane Kocho is never killed due to Doma's absence, meaning that this time, the Demon Slayer core now has 10 Hashiras, as Kane never dies. Plus, there are two flower Hashira in the same pillar generation, Kane and Shinobu Kocho. Even though everyone knew about Kane's relationship with Shinobu, what many fans did not know was her relationship with Sanemi. You see, the day Kane died, Sanemi was about to confess his feelings towards her, but due to her health, he was never able to do so. Since Kane does not die here, Sanemi confesses to her, and after that, the two of them would probably become a couple. And yeah, that would also help a little bit with Sanemi's anger issues, if you ask me. Now, when it comes to Tanjiro's generation, the main difference is that Inosuke is not a demon slayer at all. Hear this. A few years prior to the events of episode 1, Doma met a woman named Kotoha Hashibira. Kotoha had left her family with her baby son Inosuke after being fed up with the abuse of her husband and mother-in-law. Doma invited Kotoha into the Eternal Paradise cult for sanctuary, and even though Doma used to eat every woman he laid eyes on, he decided to spare Kotoha because of her impressively beautiful face and her sweet singing voice. However, one night, Kotoha accidentally encountered Doma who was devouring his victims. Doma tried to explain himself to her, but Kotoha naturally ran. Doma knew that he had to kill her because otherwise Muzan would punish him for his secret being revealed. Doma chased her to the cliff, and before Doma devoured her, Kotoha managed to throw her son into the river to protect him. Inosuke survived after being raised by a female boar, and hence, how Inosuke came to be the beast we now know in our original timeline. But since Doma is not present as a demon in this timeline, Kotoha raises Inosuke as a normal civilian, and thus, Inosuke never leaves her side. He makes sure to protect her, and because of that, he 
never joins the Demon Slayer Corps. Inosuke's absence now would indeed cause quite a few very interesting changes in our story. During Tanjiro's and Zenitsu's fight against Kyogai and the Tongue Demon, we will assume that the Demon Slayer duo still manages to come out on top. Yeah, we do admit that they'd face more difficulties due to Inosuke's absence, but even if Tanjiro is not able to defeat Kyogai on his own, we believe he will be able to hold on until the help of Zenitsu arrives. You see, after Zenitsu goes into sleep mode and quickly dispatches the Tongue Demon, he would also be able to assist Tanjiro, and hence, the two of them defeating Kyogai. But wait, because believe me, the next fight we will analyze will not go down that easy. You see, the next opponents of Tanjiro, Zenitsu, and Nezuko is Rui's spider family. And don't forget that Rui in this version of the story is Upper Moon 5, meaning that he is both stronger and a bigger threat for Demon Slayers, Hashiro's included. Being an Upper Moon, Rui would receive additional blood from Muzan, and hence, all of his fighting abilities, physical strength, regeneration, and even blood demon art would receive a significant power boost. On Zenitsu's side, his fight develops in pretty much the same way as in the original plot, as nothing really changed on that end. But on Tanjiro's side, when he is faced against Rui, he is nowhere near Rui's level. Tanjiro cannot even scratch him. The only chance for Tanjiro is to survive long enough until help arrives, and for that to happen, Rui should be playing around and not kill him instantly. And since Tanjiro has main character plot armor, well, we'll assume that this is exactly what happens. But listen, a significant change that occurs in this version of the story is which Hashiras are around, and hence arrive to help Team Tanjiro. In the original story, Giyu and Shinobu were the two Hashiras close, but now Kane is alive, meaning that Shinobu's actions and the location she is sent might be different, in the sense that she might be close to her sister more often. Based on that, there are actually three possible scenarios as to which Hashiras would arrive to help Tanjiro. The first case is that Kane and Shinobu arrive. As we just analyzed, Rui being the Upper Moon 5 is much stronger in this version of the story, so the two Hashiras would have their plates full fighting Rui, and it would definitely not be an easy encounter. Since Tanjiro in this version of the story has yet to awaken his Demon Slayer mark, no other Hashira awakens it as well. Yeah, some strong Hashiras like Muichiro are able to fight Upper Moons on their own, but that is possible only due to the Demon Slayer mark awakening. Without it, as we saw, Muichiro was powerless against Gyoko, meaning that Kane and Shinobu have to fight an Upper Moon without the Demon Slayer mark that evened the playing field a lot. When that happens, we believe that the two Hashiras would be able to defeat Rui, but one of the two of them would die in the process. The one that dies is Kane, that took the initiative as the older sister. She was the one leading the fight, meaning that Rui was more engaged and more focused on her, making Kane receive major wounds. Kane sacrificed herself, but not only Shinobu survived, but also for the first time in hundreds of years, an upper moon is defeated. But wait to hear the second version of the story. In this case, just like in the original plot, the two Hashiras that arrive in the scene stay the same aka Giyu and Shinobu. In the original story, Giyu was able to behead Rui in a single slash, but as we analyzed before, this is now impossible. The two Hashiras are fighting together, but just like in case one, one of the two of them dies. We believe that this Hashira is Shinobu, as between the two of them, Giyu is somewhat stronger. Plus, with Doma being absent from the story, Shinobu's importance in the final arc is not as crucial in this version of the story. Well, those two versions were pretty sad, right? But how about the third case? Here, we assume that the Hashiras sent to help are all three possible candidates. Giyu, Shinobu, and Kane. If that happens, then in this version of the story, the three Hashiras are now able to overpower Rui and kill him. Yeah, they surely would receive some major injuries, and they would surely not win easily. But at the end of this encounter, they managed to defeat Rui without anyone dying. But no matter which of the three scenarios happens, the story develops in a pretty similar way. And the only notable change is when we arrive in the final arc. But before that, let's see how Muzan would react to the first death of an upper moon in centuries. In the original timeline, when Daki and Gyutaro died, Muzan was not all that bothered because he did not see Daki as worthy of an upper moon, and thus he did not think impossible for the two siblings to die. As according to Muzan, Daki was basically dragging Gyutaro down as well. When Gyoko and Huntengu died in the original story now, he did not bother at all. We could even say that he was happy. That was because, due to their deaths, Muzan was able to discover that Nezuko is immune to sunlight. But now, in this version of the story, none of this applies, and hence, Muzan is furious. He wonders what good would the lower moons be if an upper moon is defeated by demon slayers. So what he does is that he summons all the lower moons. But now, instead of executing them, 
He commands them to fight each other. The last one standing will receive more blood from him and become the new Upper Moon 6, as the place of Rui is now open for taking. Nakame moves to the position of Upper Moon 5, and the winner of this blood match is promoted into Upper Moon 6. We will assume that Enmu is the one to come out on top, so that we can have the Mugen Train arc happen in this version of the story as well. Yeah, Thomas Enmu the Train appears in this timeline too. Enmu becomes the Upper Moon 6 after Rui's death, and hence is given even more blood than he was given in the original story. Enmu is now even stronger, and when it comes to the Mugen Train arc now, there are more available Hashiras around in this story. And since Inosuke is not present in this story, Rengoku is accompanied by Tanjiro, Nezuko, Zenitsu, as well as by another Hashira. Now, no matter who that Hashira may be, this will surely cause a ton of exciting changes. Even though Enmu is an upper moon, he is still inexperienced with his new boosted powers. And given that he has to fight another Hashira on top of that, we believe that Enmu is killed all the same. Yeah, maybe the difficulty with which he dies is higher, but after some time, he is indeed beheaded. When Goku, Zenitsu, and Nezuko protect the passengers, while Tanjiro and this other Hashira kill Enmu. Just like in the original plot, no one dies within the train. But the most exciting change happens now that Akaza appears. In this version of the story, Akaza is now faced against both Rengoku and another Hashira. Even though the two Hashiras are not able to defeat Akaza alone, after all, none of them is marked. The most thrilling change is that Rengoku does not become a donut and remains alive until further down the story. The next arc that took place after the Mugen Train arc was the Entertainment District arc. But since in this version of the story, Yutaro and Daki were never turned into demons by Doma, this arc is completely absent from the story. Because of that, Tengen never retires and remains an active Hashira. Now, when it comes to the Swordsmith Village arc, in the original story, Tanjiro has already awakened the mark before this arc started in his fight with Yutaro. Here, we assume that the first time Tanjiro awakens the mark is early on against his fight with Hantengu. Because of that, Moichiro is also able to awaken the mark against Kyoko. And overall, the same things happen as in the original story. Moichiro defeats Kyoko, Mitsuri, Tanjiro, Genya, and Nezuko defeat Hantengu, and Nezuko is exposed to the sun without dying. But you see, in preparations of the final arc, Muzan decides to promote more demons into the ranks of upper moons, since in this version of the story, we already had three of the six upper moons being killed. The demons that become upper moons, even before the final arc begins, are Kaigaku, as well as two more demons we were not introduced to in the original story. Let's just call them Demon A and Demon B. During the Infinity Castle arc, depending on what happened all the way back when the Demon Slayers encountered Rui, we have nine or ten Hashiras alive and ready to fight instead of just eight. You see, Rengoku and Tengen that were not part of the original fight in the original story are now present. If the first case scenario happened during the encounter of Rui, then Kane died, and hence, we have nine Hashiras in the final arc. If the second version happened, then Shinobu died, and we still have nine Hashiras, with the only difference being that Kane simply takes the place of Shinobu. But if the third case scenario happened, then both of them survived, and thus, the Hashiras are even stronger, as now they have ten active members. The final battles happen as following. Kokushibo fights Gyomei, Sanemi, Moichiro, and Genya. The outcome is exactly the same as in the original plot, with Moichiro and Genya dying along with Kokushibo. Akaza, on the other hand, is now faced against Tanjiro, Giyu, and Rengoku. The small difference in this scenario is that Rengoku receives his mark during this fight, but overall, the three Demon Slayers defeat Akaza without anyone dying. Kaigaku was faced against everyone's favorite sleeping Pikachu, aka Zenitsu, which, again, the exact same things happen as in the original story, meaning that Zenitsu uses Thunder Breathing 7th form and destroys Kagaku. Nakime, on the other hand, is faced against Obanai and Mitsuri, in which, again, she ends up dead. The two new upper moons, on the other hand, Demon A and Demon B, are faced against Kanao, Tengen, and either one or both of Shinobu and Kane, depending on which of the three scenarios happened back when the Demon Slayers fought Rui. The Demon Slayers managed to win again without casualties, as those two upper moons lack experience in using their upper moon powers. Now, during the final battle against Muzan, we have Gyomei, Sanemi, Tanjiro, Giyu, Rengoku, Zenitsu, Kanao, Tengen, and either one or both of Kane and Shinobu. But you see, everyone is severely injured due to their previous battles. Just like in the original story, Muzan is indeed defeated in the end after an exhausting fight. But the survivors of this timeline are a little bit different, as more Hashiras were alive to fight Muzan. The ones who make it out alive are Sanemi, Tanjiro, Giyu, Zenitsu, Kanao, Tengen, and Rengoku. Yeah, this ending is indeed kind of wholesome, as Rengoku managed to stay alive all the way until the end. However, in the original timeline,
mind, not everything is as wholesome as that. Check out this video, where we present the 52 saddest facts you probably never noticed in Demon Slayer. Go on, check it out!